world gone insane. An upside down civilization cannot be real. A world of madness and terror. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's a good one. I'm telling you right up front. Two quick things. One, thanks to everybody who went over to the new Facebook page and threw us a like. That's a Facebook forward slash official Dana Gould. And also on my website, we're trying to find a way to do a listener forum area where y'all can chat. And uh, we're trying to figure out the best way to do that. If you have an idea, I'd love to hear it. And a special thank you to Dave Anthony and Greg Barrett from Walking the Room, who've actually given me a lot of great advice. Walking the Room is a great podcast that I am actually on this week. So if you are fans of that podcast and this podcast, you will be getting very sick of me very quickly. Upcoming personal appearances, I will be in San Francisco at Cobb's Comedy Club, March 23rd through the 25th. I will be performing with the lovely and talented Dave Keckner. He will also soon be gracing these microphones. You can get tickets for that at CobbsComedyClub.com. And check this out. That very same weekend, in that very same town, our own Eddie Pepitone will be across town at the Punchline. So why not see both of us, San Francisco? You can check out tickets for Eddie's show at PunchlineComedyClub.com. April 14th, I will be headlining the Melrose Improv right here in Los Angeles. And later that month, I will be in Austin, Texas at the Moon Tower Comedy Festival. And that will be April 26th and 27th. Uh, information can be found on their website, MoontowerComedyFestival.com. But you can also get everything through my own website, which is DanaGould.com. There's no guessing there. Have you ever thought, how can I help the Dana Gould Hour podcast? How can I be a part of that family without having to physically relocate? It is very simple. Going to Amazon.com? Well, why not visit DanaGould.com first? Then right under the latest edition of the podcast, click on the Amazon banner. That will take you directly to Amazon.com. You do your shopping. It helps us pay the bills. The end, pure and simple. Your part is done. Now, like the mighty Komodo dragon, today's show is big, strong, and smells vaguely like chicken. Ken Daly is on assignment, but we have the hilarious John Ennis, the mighty, mighty Eddie Pepitone, and the scourge of the San Francisco Police Department, young Matt Weinholt. I would tell you when the show is starting, but it already has. The explosive power delivered by all bombs dropped by U.S. planes in World War II did not equal that released by the recent test explosion of an H-bomb. How much heat does an H-bomb produce? The temperature on the surface of the fireball is as great as that generated on the surface of the sun. Small wonder, then, that an H-bomb can virtually destroy everything within a radius of three miles from blast center. The blast alone is capable of gouging out a hole a mile across and 175 feet deep. What does all this have to do with neighborliness, you ask? The grim truth is that more than ever before in history, we must learn the most ultimate of all objectives, survival. Are you ready for an interruption of life services? Okay, now, I got to tell you, I am a guy who talks about the apocalypse a lot on stage, and um, I really am not ready. Like, yeah. I was thinking if there was an earthquake in L.A., someone recently told me that if there was an earthquake in L.A., you would be cut off from everything. Like a big, big earthquake, the yeah. big one. Well, the odds of the big one happening in the next 37 years are 30%. That's a, that's a 7.8 to 7.9 magnitude quake along the San Andreas Fault with the fault movement lasting uh, about 55 seconds. Whoa. The, the Northridge quake in 94 was seven seconds. No. Yeah. Well, I figure if I could survive the movie Battlestar Galactica and sense around, then I'm ready for the real thing. I'm uh -huh. ready to go. Um, 
I think I would be one of the guys who would be kind of a parasite on the people who are prepared. Right. Like I would be like, hello, do you like, have any batteries? <laughs> hello. I would just be like the funny survivor right. in an itinerant land of gangs. Yes. Like just being like, hey, guys, isn't yeah. this nuts? <laughs> I think it'd be good if you asked for stuff. Like everybody's going to look for water. Everybody's going to look for first aid supplies. I would be like, guys, got any crunch and munch? <laughs> Do you have an old Ganip Ganop or Monopoly board? <laughs> Ganip Ganop, by the way, ping pong backwards. I hope you're ready to have your mind blown. <laughs> Sorry, did I just drop a truth bomb on you? <laughs> Ganip Ganop is ping pong backwards! <laughs> How much water do you like? I have a lot because I have kids and I sort of feel that it is my responsibility. My parents' whole deal with us is we will feed and clothe you until you're 18. And then it is yes. time to say sayonara. <laughs> we have seven days worth of water and like these little food pack things that we put aside. But Eight. that's only yeah. seven, seven, seven days. days. So I, I'm very optimistic. That's a optimistic. good amount, though. I, I have a feeling that something will come back and that they'll dig me out of my house and but I would be food. I would start that seven day fast like there is a seven day fast that I've always been meaning to do that would be well, perfect so then you'd have two weeks as opposed to one right <laughs> you'd have two weeks and then you just eat all that stuff in one day just in one sitting that would be hilarious. <laughs> like, but it's also it's it's a lot of power bars yeah which is a lot of constipation which is going to be a good thing yeah because the water ain't running were you here in the ninety four quake. Uh, I was I not would, here. I was in San Francisco for that quake. Right. And uh, Boy, you're I, a bit of a quake snob. Well, That's where they've had <laughs> that the was, greatest well, quake. And then you were down here for the quake. call that the good one. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I grew up in San Francisco, oh, and I, the quakes are all the time. And so it was amazing that like I was on the top floor of this apartment building, and this thing went on for a long time. And I remember I was talking to wow. my brother, and then it was over. We were like, wow, that was quite a quake there. Anyway, so when are we going to get dinner? And like, it was yeah. like, you don't take it seriously. You figure, oh, it's going to end. And really? You don't really think about it during it. You don't have time to appreciate it because you're so freaked out that you're in it. Yeah. And then yeah. afterwards, you freak out. It's just like having sex for the first time. <laughs> you can't enjoy it during it because yeah, yeah. you're just so freaked out that it's actually happening. Freak and then when New it's York. over, you just think, I got to get out of here. I got here from New York in about 2002, and the first one I went through, my apartment building swayed. And yeah, oh, sensually. I was like, <laughs> swooned. Sh- yeah. I was so scared, you know, and I pride myself on a complete macho attitude toward everything except my shrink. Yeah, and people should know, <laughs> yeah, people should know that don't see you in your daily life. You walk around in a full set of pads, <laughs> elbow, knee, helmet. You look like a guy that just got off a of hockey practice. Yeah, you didn't like, have time to take his pads off. Yeah, it's like, are you playing rollerball now? <laughs> I'm just in Ralph's in that gear, going. What do you mean you don't have jazz apples? You see how how padded up I am? I'll kill everybody in here. On nine eleven. Yeah. Uh, oh, one. I always specify when I say on 9-11. <laughs> oh, one. Not oh, seven. Um, I was on The Simpsons at that time, and I, I, I didn't go in <laughs> to work, obviously. And Even here in Southern California? Yeah. Were you here then? No, I was oh, in no, New York. Just... I was right by oh, it, really? which was just unbelievable. Oh, oh, really? So I guess that's... Well, let me get back to my story. <laughs> yeah. You were right by 9-11 when it happened? <laughs> anyway, I was out here. Oh, so tell me about that. I didn't know that. Well, well that's I mean, crazy. That's... No, I mean... This story is going to be fun. No, you guys go to New York. <laughs> I was at 13th, 12th Street. I keep getting closer. She's yeah. telling her the story. Yeah. I was right at the base. <laughs> no, I was on the roof. <laughs> I rode the roof down like Silver Surfer. <laughs> No, but uh, like I was at 12th Street, which was far enough away where it wasn't like in danger, but just so bizarre. Like my friend called me. I'm a late sleeper. My friend called me and says, we've been attacked. And um, I'm like, what are you talking about? And I went out of my apartment. And And you immediately thought, men by the feminazis? (laughs) (laughs) That's what Rush Limbaugh every day. We've been attacked. (laughs) They want health care. First of all, I I want a blanket apology before this (laughs) statement I'm about to say. I didn't know now had planes. (laughs) (laughs) He sleeps at night. Feminazi. 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 Gloria Steinem and some poet from a very small coffee shop have rammed planes into Century City, California. 
Every radio station is now playing the Indigo Girls by order of the new government. Back to 9-11. So I... I, 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 I here's, here's a segue that's never done for that topic. <laughs> now let's, let's get back to 9-11. God damn it, Arnie. When I say back to 9-11, I want the laugh track cued. Um, so anyway... I, let's get I, back to 9-11. Now, Eddie, you were there. But I, I get out of my apartment, and because I lived on Broadway, scores of people are walking up Broadway, like suits. It looked yeah. like something from the movie Brazil. Just right. people walking in suits. away, walking uptown. It had already happened a while ago. Right. They weren't walking downtown, they were walking uptown. That was but it was question. weird. You know, that was the type of thing where if you were far enough away from it, like even I was in the village, you just watched TV all day. Yeah. And then we walked out. It was the most beautiful day. We walked out. And it was a gorgeous of, day. I mean, I was I mean, weather wise, let me specify. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beautiful Indian summer day. I do remember that. And I was, I, I was scared. My sister worked downtown. Oh, and yeah. I was legitimately, like, scared. And that was the first time, like, something like that hit me. Like, whoa, I have a family member. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I am so ill-prepared uh, for any kind of natural disaster in L.A. because I can't even get my files together in my little workspace. How am I going to – like, you're amazing to me. You showed me your little apocalyptic yeah. garage where yes. you have everything from frozen yogurt to chow mein. Like, I'm you very, just add I'm water actually, and it's yes. like a four-star I'm very meal. ill-prepared, actually. <laughs> I have a lot of jigsaw puzzles. I have one, one tennis ball. <laughs> For the dogs have, in the neighborhood? I have a hastily put together earthquake survival <laughs> kit. It's like a pillow set, some Mad Libs, no food or medicine. <laughs> just stuff I see lying around. The, time. Stuff I find around the house. I don't know where else to put it. I just put it in the earthquake kit. <laughs> Look, a salute to Harry Morgan. Rubik's Cube. Who Rubik's wants a cubes. nice cold glass of gravy? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's going on for dinner? I don't know, but I have three sets of rubber fangs. <laughs> uh, no, well, again... Because of the kids. If there was an earthquake when I was single, I'm, I'd immediately like be putting on a lot of lipstick and a feather boa heading down to Hollywood Boulevard. I'm going to give me some money for power bars. Yeah, yeah I a- would immediately hop on the back of the guy with the Mohawks motorcycle. <laughs> the Denver yeah. Road Warrior. <laughs> right, you- Take care of me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, yeah. Just be like, yes, I'll do anything you want. Exactly. This is my girlfriend, Karen. And we'll get to like people that are really concerned about this. Which about is sick. more than the earthquake. End times? Yeah, they call it the event oh, survivalist. That and, sounds and, TV-ish, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, that's how they talk about it in there. Like, if you read Soldier of Fortune magazine and those, oh, I'm, there's I'm, a lot of people out there. I find it endlessly fascinating. Really? I really do. The event. When you go through a period where the day-to-day life is seriously disrupted, people really don't know how to behave. And so 9-11 happened. All right, no one's going to work. And there were a lot of people at... The Simpsons that didn't know where to go, and I lived kind of central, so I just just come over here. Just, you right. know, my right, wife right. and I were home, and we were like, just come over. Our oh, house. did people just come and talk and watch TV? Well, we just we we all watched it at my house, and then but it was such a bizarre moment. My wife said, "We don't have any food," so I'm like, "Okay." I ran down to the Ralphs, which is the big supermarket on Sunset Boulevard, which uh, for those of you who don't live in LA is called Rock and Roll Ralphs. Oh yes, because right. it's. In the cluster of like apartment buildings where it's just a bunch of people that work and live at the guitar center. And, <laughs> is me, that why it's, and, it's on the rock guess, and roll strip? Let me guess. Ralph's already had 9 11 cakes. <laughs> 9 11. <laughs> but it was misspelled. It was, it was 9 apostrophe 11 with a possessive S. <laughs> Supermarket signs that are grammatically incorrect drive me berserk. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I see it all the day. Like bananas, apostrophe S. Fuck. Like, why that? That's wrong. <laughs> that's the crumbling. Of society that, yeah, that I'm concerned with mm-hmm. the crumbling of grammar. That's the Omega yeah. Man. <laughs> is that S with an apostrophe? <laughs> so I go into the Rock and Roll Ralphs. It is empty. It is like the Omega Man. This because everyone's watching television. Yeah, everyone's watching 9/11. That's funny that you're just whistling through the aisles. <laughs> it was the. It was so weird. I run. I literally. I get a bunch of hot dogs and potato chips because people are coming over our house. And we yeah. don't have anything to feed them. I swear to Christ. I check out, and the back boy just goes, totally happy. Yeah. Oh, man, you're having a party. Oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, no. Have you he seen has no news? clue? If you're talking about surviving the apocalypse, or any situation that is, shall we say, apocalypse adjacent, then you've got to talk about the Omega Man. 
the 1971 Charlton Heston Last Man on Earth sci-fi classic. Based on a novel by the great Richard Matheson called I Am Legend. Sound familiar? It was written in 1954 and tells the story of a plague of vampirism that wipes out all of humanity except for poor Robert Neville, who has to deal. I Am Legend is an excellent book. Such a great fun read. Actually, Stephen King cites it as a major influence, and really easy to see why. We highly recommend it. From the Gould book bag to you, I Am Legend. Before it was made into the Omega Man, it was made into the 1964 Vincent Price schlocker The Last Man on Earth, which Richard Matheson actually wrote, but he didn't like the way it came out, so he changed his name in the credits to Logan Swanson, which I think sounds vaguely porny. Maybe that's just me. I think everything sounds vaguely porny. Butter cookies, French toast. I bet they all have different meanings on a porn set. I really like The Last Man on Earth. It looks a lot like Night of the Living Dead, but it predated that film by four years. The only problem with the film is that Vincent Price is the hero. He's the regular Joe that you're supposed to relate to, and that never quite comes off. December 1965. Is that all it has been since I inherited the world? Only three years. It seems like a hundred million. Eventually, he meets a woman, but it turns out she is not all that she seems. Ain't that always the way? There's one really good part of the film at the very end where Vincent Price, facing down his army of attackers, gets off one great Vincent Price line. You freaks! All of you. All of you freaks! I'm a man. The last man. The film did not do a ton of business, In fact, when The Omega Man went into pre-production, only seven years later, the producers had never even heard of it. But I guess the guy who owned the rights informed them. I guess they struck a deal. In Charlton Heston's book, The Actor's Life, which are his printed journals, uh, his quote is, Screen the last man on earth today at Warner's. Nothing against Vinny, but it's not that much. My favorite scene in The Omega Man is right at the very beginning when Heston standing alone in a big intersection in downtown Los Angeles, imagines that all the pay phones start ringing. There is no phone ringing, damn it! There is no phone. Nice and creepy. The vampires from I Am Legend have now become a band of technology-hating albino pyromaniacs, thus dispensing with the crosses and stakes and allowing Charlton to handle things in a more Hestonian manner. Something else is very different in The Omega Man from the other movie and from the book. The early 1970s was the heyday of black exploitation cinema. Up yours! Get out of the way! Shaft's his name. Shaft's his game. When Foxy Brown comes to town, all the brothers gather round. Cause she can really shake them down. Foxy lady, Foxy lady. And the producers of the Omega Man thought, wow, those black exploitation films are making a lot of money. I'd like to make some of that money too. And so the Omega Man became the first post apocalyptic black exploitation kinda zombie movie. And yet the whole family can't bring him down out of that. That monkey paradise, brother. Forget the old ways, brother. All the old hatreds, all the old pain. Forget and remember, the family is one. And then there's Rosalind Cash, the female lead in the film, coming across as a 
very Foxy Brown with her afro and leather-clad badassery. Off-screen, supposedly, she was somewhat intimidated by acting against Charlton Heston, who was, after all, Moses. But on-screen, she has no trouble at all. Uh-uh, don't turn and just stand. When I want you to turn, I'll turn you on or off, up or around. I'll turn you, now cool it. My name's Robert. Your name's Mud. But they became friends. You're sweet. It's okay, Tommy. This is the man, and I mean the man. But he's cool. It's okay. Friends who kiss on the lips. Now, what you thinking? Yeah. Well, you know the uh, old song? If you were the only girl in the world and I were the only boy, okay. But uh, till then, don't bother me. I guess I'm the only boy. You know, it's been a long, long time. I'm not sure I remember how this goes. The Omega Man has one of the first interracial love scenes in a major motion picture. And it happened because Charlton Heston, right-wing, arch-conservative Charlton Heston, made it happen. I have to say, from a first-hand perspective, I did Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect, the show that he had on ABC before the HBO series. I did it with Charlton Heston back in the late 1990s. And I have to tell you, although we disagreed on just about everything, he could not have been a nicer guy. After the show, I told him how much I love Planet of the Apes, and I'll never forget it. I said, you know, this might sound dorky, but when I was a kid, Planet of the Apes meant as much to me as baseball means to most kids. And I'll never forget it. He put both hands on my shoulders, and he said, this might be dorky too, but I'd be happy to send you a photo from the film if you'd like. And I wrote down my address, and I handed it to him, and he put it in his pocket, and four days later, showed up in the mail. And it is framed on my wall to this day, and I still have the envelope. That is not the end of the Omega Man story. It was remade again in 2007 with Will Smith under the original title, I Am Legend. And I am willing to bet that the entire budget of the Omega Man probably came close to the latte budget on I Am Legend. But the Omega Man is the one that I love. One last little tidbit, and this is a spoiler alert if you've never seen the film. The fountain at the very end of the movie, into which Charlton Heston bleeds to death, is the very same fountain at the beginning of Friends, both shot on the Warner Brothers Ranch in beautiful downtown Burbank. No, they sure don't make pictures like that anymore. Don't touch my bags if you Now, remember, I thought it was weird because the record store was closed. The Virgin Megastore was right at the corner of Laurel and Sunset. This was back when we had CD stores. You had to yes. buy music. You yes. had to leave yes. your chair. And it was closed. And I thought that was like, well, that's weird. Because <laughs> it was just a weekday. I think it was like a Monday or Tuesday morning. And it was like... They closed the record store. By the way, that's what people get into, especially the soldier of fortune people, the people who talk about the event. Their lives are so horrific that they, they can't want wait. this yeah. stuff to happen because it heightens their fucking banal, horrible existences. They, yeah. they, they want moments to be like, look at it. Look at it. This is just what I was hoping for. Right. No more day-to-day grind yeah. where I'm considered yeah. a piece of shit. There was some story that I heard on the radio about some guy that was uh, – he was going to some uh, bachelor party, and he had a blow-up doll in his car, you know, mm-hmm. convertible. I was fucking a blow-up doll, and it popped. That was my 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> I have four older brothers and my dad, and they're all hunters. I had a rifle cabinet in my bedroom in high school because it was the room that it fit in. Dana um, may be a what? nerd, but he's well-armed. I'm, I, you had an Uzi-shaped room? I can clean a twenty two. <laughs> when I was a kid, we used to fantasize about going to Disneyland. And for us, that was like going to the moon because it was so antithetical to what you're to our reality. And I remember like watching Thunderball in the scene where he's on the island and he fights the guys and they go into the pool full of sharks and the guy gets killed by the sharks. And just thinking that guy has an in-ground pool (laughs) (laughs) and the Godfather, when Michael kills Sterling Hayden, the police sergeant in the restaurant, we were like. They just went to a restaurant. (laughs) It wasn't even somebody's birthday. They just, like, went out to eat one night. So our our bar was set low, and one of our big recreations was we would go down to the dump and shoot 
rats and or old dryers. <laughs> I'm glad um, you added dryer to yeah. that. <laughs> we used to shoot. So, you know, so I, but I, I, I'm not a gun uh, aficionado. Um, <clears throat> but my, Do you my, have one here? I don't know. Maybe I do. Maybe <laughs> I, don't. I don't like guns. Me neither, man. I don't, because I'm, I'm of that mentality. When I hold a gun, the first thing I think is, I could kill myself right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they did I'm study. like that with like open windows above the fourth floor. I could kill myself right now. I look at everything mm-hmm. that comes into my hand as a way to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> Want a Twinkie? If you gave me eight, I could choke myself with them. <laughs> Would you buy me some pantyhose? And then I can gag myself with them and die. You're reading Dr. Wayne Dyer's Love is the Answer. I could kill myself with this book. I could eat this book and choke. <laughs> no, on the other hand, your fear is earthquake, 72 hours with no real civilian order and then you know night number one you guys got any food jesus <laughs> you know womp, womp, womp. So scary. And, then, and, then, and then a gun would be like what no so now i'll kill you <laughs> look mister we don't have any food here so you just skedaddle or the other option is just make them think you're really crazy like just open the door wearing like a world war one bomber's hat with lipstick and a heart on. Nothing else. I've been waiting for you guys. That's your hope. And Honey, no... send the electrical jolt through me. I need a heart on. And there's no power. So you have to hold those tiny LED flashlights on yourself. Just hold them all like Rocky J squirrel hat, lipstick, pink feather boa, a hard on, and some rain boots. That's how I open the door when they come for my food. Oh, I like, see. Yeah. You're at home. They just open the door and you just sit there going, when it says Libby's, Libby's, Libby's on the label, label, label. And they just go, oh, not another one. Yep. This whole program, yeah. by the way, can I just say this is scaring me? I'm a type of guy who completely ignores the possibility of this thing, and that's how I go day to day. I want to get back to the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but with hurricanes, with blizzards, Blizzards with mm-hmm. earthquakes, which happen, you know, there will be periods where you have to be self-sufficient for a certain amount of time. And it all depends on how long that period will be. And I always look to Hurricane Katrina. People only have to miss one or two meals and things start getting hinky right away and especially katrina where the cops just started shooting people (laughs) and you know it doesn't really take much for society to unwind like a cheap baseball three days away from barbarism isn't that the isn't that you know what's interesting though bringing up hurricane katrina is the media will be filming la's disintegration yes let's say there is a huge earthquake here yeah will be being filmed yeah is that correct yeah and there will be a helicopter has to have a camera over us and it might not happen for a hundred years, the big earthquake. I'm hoping. Yeah. But it's inevitable that these plates shift, you know, and it's all a matter of how prepared you are for it. And it is, can you take care of yourself and the people that depend on you? And can you protect them? And I can't protect shit. Me you know, I lose argument with squirrels, you know. Did I just say argument? I lose. <laughs> I lose, lose argument. argument with squirrel. Oh, I'm Mongo, my college roommate, all over again. Ah, there we go. Mongo lose argument with squirrel. Mongo's Help. muscles are hard. Mongo's eyes are soft. <laughs> How people make carpet? <laughs> it all fuzzy and. Mongo, you haven't slept for days. How people make carpet? <laughs> birds cannot eat Mongo's muscles, but birds can eat Mongo's eyes. Mongo's eyes are Mongo's weak link. <laughs> Are you a bird? No, Mongo. <laughs> the way you channel Mongo is scary. <laughs> Mongo want to go to couples therapy. That's my dream. I have a nightmare that I live with Mongo and that we have to go to couples therapy. And because it's a dream, for some reason, the couples therapist is Paul Stanley of Kiss. <laughs> Hi, come on in, Dana. Come on in, Mongo. <laughs> Boy, you guys have problems. Before oh we get started, God. let me tell you about how we recorded Kiss Alive 2. <laughs> you know, many of those songs are what we call Jive Live. Every time Mongo and Dana come to Paul Stanley for help, Paul Stanley talk about Paul Stanley. <laughs> I know, I don't get it. And then we just thought on Love Gun, let's record it in the studio and put the audience underneath it. <laughs> this guy's boring me, Mongo. Mongo Boy 2. See, we don't have many problems. We can still bond over how much we think Paul Stanley, bad therapist. <laughs> Want to get fried chicken? Yeah, Mongo, let's get fried chicken. They think that I don't know what I'm doing, but look at them happily going out for fried chicken. Another couple saved. Paul's family, couple's therapist. Nice. 
Welcome to Political Talk with two guys from Boston, a working man's look at the socio-political issues of our day. And now, Political Talk with two guys from Boston. How you doing? I'm uh, Johnny Condon. Yeah, this is Robbie Sullivan. This is Political Talk with two guys from Boston. We work for uh, Bevel Aqua Heating and Air Conditioning Repair. Yeah, we're cool if you are cool. Bevel Aqua. So in the news today, we're talking about the gay marriage amendments that you will see popping up as we near election time. It is a standard trope. Yeah. of the uh, conservative movement to get these things on the ballot, and that way that gets people out there, uh, yeah. whether they're for it or against it, it gets people to vote. You know, it's like a uh, gay marriage amendment on a ballot is like sticking a chocolate-covered donut inside a turkey and yeah. giving it to a bunch of five-year-olds. Yeah. It's like they don't want the turkey, but it's like there's a donut in there, oh, they will clear yeah. that carcass. I, I'll have it. Yeah. I don't care what kind of drippings are on it. It's like shopping. You, you're putting all this stuff in your cart, and nobody wants Wonder Bread, but everyone buys it. I always judge people by whether or not they buy the off-market raisin bran. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's Post. But I don't even think they have Post raisin bran anymore. How much more is it for the real there stuff? There was Kellogg's raisin bran, yeah. and then there was Post raisin bran. Yeah. And I think, I don't know this, but I think one day the Post raisin bran guy, they went to his house and they found him shot in the eye. <laughs> I like that image very much. I, I like I, the image of the Kellogg's rooster walking out of the house with a smoking Glock <laughs> and the head of Post Raisin Bran just with his eye open. There's one type of Raisin Bran. You can buy it at, like, uh, what's it called? Shop for More or whatever the hell the name of the place is. And you, and you get it, and it doesn't get soggy in milk. Really? No matter how much milk you It's pour mostly it. styrofoam. Yeah, you could soak it for a day. It's like hot as a rock. It's like a McDonald's shake. Yeah. It's like they grind up the lid of a styrofoam cooler. Yeah. And put it in the shake. Yeah, it's not made from food. It's not supposed to be. It's just supposed to fill you up for a long time. McRib is back. Where'd it go? Now, you would eat a McRib. I would not. I would eat three of them, and then that's it for the season. Is there any meat in a McRib? Uh, there's no bone in it. There is meat, but it's not from what you think. But isn't a rib a bone? Isn't that the whole point of a rib, to have a bone? Originally. But like McDonald's is just the same way that, like, you genetically engineer something. Like, you know, the chickens at KFC don't have any feathers on them or whatever. Like, somebody walked no, into the, the warehouse and was like, what's this? KFC chickens, if you look at the document, they are born with no feathers, yeah. no head, and fully cooked. People are upset about this. I was thrilled. Yeah. I thought, this is great. Cut out the middleman. It's like if you could genetically engineer deer yeah. to get depressed and shoot themselves. Then you wouldn't even have to go out there. It just makes hunting easier. These chickens are born without feathers. Yeah. How do they get the feathers off the fucking chicken? Is it one of these things where they just yell at every baby chick, don't have feathers, and then after like five generations, they begin to evolve? I, yeah, Knock I don't know. that feather shit off, you clucking piece of shit. Well, I think it's back to the gay marriage thing. If you yelled at your kid enough times, don't be gay, I think it's going to make them want to be gay. I think yeah. it's going to make a chicken want to grow feathers. But then, yeah, a chicken would come out all feathers. Because it'd be so sure Wait I'm a supposed minute. to have Holy them. shit. That's what we do. You go opposite. We breed chickens that are all feathers and open a fucking pillow warehouse. Oh, my God. When do we start? And I've already lost interest. That's why I'm not a businessman. <laughs> and the you lost time interest took, halfway through the idea? You know, the other thing I think of, I could do that or just own a moon bounce oh, and just drive yeah. around. You'd have to be able to find a truck. Have you seen these trucks? They're so small that they build up the walls up high. Yeah, yeah. So they don't want a big truck. That wouldn't make any sense to them, too much gas. But you just go straight up in the air like a building in a small neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Straight up, get a better view. Yeah, tower over the other buildings, deprive them of sunlight, pretty Everyone soon they else. move. Yeah, but now you can get your bounce around as long as you take the air out of it. I don't know how they do that, but I, I'm always very impressed when one pours out of that little truck with the huge sides up it. When I was a kid, there was a carnival that came to our town. Oh, I love that. And uh, they had a moon bounce. Yeah. And I was afraid that the moon bounce would become untethered and float away with me in it. Wow. And my parents never said, no, that can't happen because it's not helium, it's just air. It's not good to get rid of a kid's fear. It's what grounds them. It's true. I have gone into someone's backyard when I was hammered, gotten into the moon bounce and woken up. Oh, yeah. And like, where am I? Where am I? Oh, I'm not on the moon, but it's comfortable with the morning dew. And I went to meetings for a while. How is that? It's great. You know, you go to a meeting, you, you watch people, what do they eat, cookies, and they, and they drink bad coffee. Yeah, I had to, I had to go to one of those meetings because I got pulled over, open container law. Oh, yeah. I had seven. Wait, what? I had seven open containers. How do you do that? I was making zombies. Oh, no Going kidding. down the 93. I was oh. driving down the Cape. I was, yeah. by, I was making a zombie. And uh, I got pulled over. And that was not my car. That's another story. But I had to go to meetings, and it's just people sitting around eating sugar cookies and bitching. I could do that all fucking day. It's like visiting your aunt. They told me to go to 10 of them. I went to four of them and, like, figured out the signature, and I just signed the rest of them. You know why? So they give you a card. You know, quitter. Yeah, I'm not going to quit. Here's my theory. I will happily quit drinking. Yeah. But I got to find something else to get a buzz. 
You know, right. I don't mind not drinking. Yeah. I'm not like an alcoholic in that no, regard. No, no, no. I just got to find a buzz someplace. Yeah, what are you going to do next? Yeah. That's the thing. That's yeah. what they never tell you. Oops. That's the most important part. Did you see that documentary about the guy who hung out with the bears and then eventually the bear ate him? I heard about it, but I yeah. ain't watching that. It was called, I don't yeah, know what the fucking name was. Yeah. The guy moved out to live with the bears. What would make a bear kill a man? In this one case, the guy was just... this guy for like... I, they just get annoyed. Tom. You could just see the bear go, I've had about enough. Yeah, what are you doing? You don't think I see you watching me every day? You, you co-create this. You know, it's, it's partly bear, but it's also you. You decided when you came into this life, I think I'll go out getting eaten by a bear. Yeah, you're the author of your own fate. Last time, something else happened. This time... I'm going to get eaten by a bear. Right. That's the Hindu belief that you keep coming back. Yeah. And you, you decide. You co-create. You make some sort of sacred pact from wherever. And it's like ancestral healing. Someone said, you know, to atone for what you did last time, this time, what if you got eaten by a bear? Oh, I think that is true. So check this out. <laughs> Everybody who's been eaten by a bear yeah. panics. Oh, yeah. And when you panic, you shit yourself. Yeah. So everybody that a bear has ever eaten has had a fucking load going. I, I don't think that's nice for the bear, quite frankly. No, they call it fear pudding. But bears must think that we all walk around with shit in their pants oh. because they've never met anybody who doesn't have shit in their pants. Oh, that's a really good point. Fucking bears. Smarter than the average bear. All that means is that you know people don't all have shit in their drawers. Does a bear shit in the woods? Well, I think it does. That's Political Talk with two guys from Boston. I'm Robbie Sullivan. I'm Johnny Carney. Get the fuck out of here. Seriously. Political Talk with Two Guys from Boston. Now, I know zombies are not real. However, in the original Dawn of the Dead, what they do in the mall that they're held up in is... Uh, I they, like how you said, I know zombies are not real. I'm telling that to myself, really. Yeah. You say <laughs> that like, I think you believe you. I let's just say it's possible. Just the idea of in that movie, what they do to hide themselves from the zombies is they take a normal stairwell and they cover it up to make it look like it doesn't exist at all. So they just put a wall over it. And that is my number one plan for all. So what you're saying is create a wall to put in front of it. So what you are saying is your way of survival is trompe l'île. Mm -hmm. Which is what that is. Yeah. What, what, what's that French word? Uh, trompe l'oeil, which is a fake wall, painting of a wall. Oh, cool. Yes. Painting of a room that's not there. So it, you're just going to be like an illusionist, like I, the, exactly, Doug yeah. Henning, the Doug I, Henning of the apocalypse. You know, if you could just get away from all the craziness, then you, every once in a while, you, you know, you go out and I'll, scavenge I'll, for I'm, food or whatever and then bring it back. I'm going to paint myself silver like those statues that you see in public and just do... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, that's not a that's not a person, Al. I'm pretty sure it is he moved. No, 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 no. <laughs> the guy in Venice. <laughs> the guy in, I'm gonna be the guy in Venice for the first seventy two hours. Yeah. The biggest victims of the uh, let's call it the disruption of services. <laughs> Just my Electricity is the thing that keeps us civil, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. No yeah. electric and we're done. Isn't that correct? That was the big yeah. George Carlin bit at the end of I believe it was Maybe not his funniest special, but certainly his most interesting. Uh, <laughs> was that his last one? No, the one before that called Life is Worth Losing. He was in the middle of a depression that he later acknowledged. He did? Yeah, and it's all about just death and dying. And the last thing is like, what's going to happen when we shut off the power for a couple of days? And, and the big fear is always like, Dad, didn't you fucking think we'd need to eat? Around here, there's just going to be some gang that has a map of houses, and they're going to label people. Oh, he's a whimsical guy. Let's go after him. He's he's full of whimsy. This guy is he's down to earth. Like who's Wayfish? <laughs> well, during the L.A. riots in 1992, from my front yard, I will show you a photo of me in my front yard being incredibly whimsical while L.A. burns to the ground behind me. There are like. 21 fires burning behind me. And I'm Is that my, right? And I'm in my front yard going, gee. And it was all kind of funny because we were watching the news. Yeah. And it was all in South Central and it was all in Riverside. And we were like, yeah. oh, boy, this is creepy. And then Where were you then? I was in a house on Laurel Canyon just kind of behind the Laugh Factory, like up above oh, Hollywood you were over Boulevard. There? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I live two doors down from Richard Lewis, nice. um, the comedian. He was pacing in his front yard. Was, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I... <laughs> he was in uh, black coveralls and a black mining helmet. <laughs> he was reading his notes off a of looter. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was suddenly the rioters attacked Sammy's camera, which was like, wait, that's, that's right, right down there. Right, right over there. And it's like, why do they want finishing fluid? <laughs> 
And then it got – Is that know, a camera term? Yeah. <laughs> I knew it. And then – and this is what kind of made me laugh. Then they got to Hollywood Boulevard and they were looting Victoria's Secret. And that's what – Of I, course. This is no longer about sending a message to the man. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> They've taken all the teddies. They mean business. <laughs> Um, you know, I was living with a, you know, a couple of people in a house and like the stores cleaned out. So what happened is all the wealthy people in Brentwood yeah. split. They did. They huh? all went to the Four Seasons in Santa Barbara. Kevin, did they? Those yes. motherfuckers. And my friend Kevin Rooney said, you could see them flying up the 101 North, dropping powdered wigs and bonbons like the aristocracy <laughs> fleeing Paris during the French Revolution. <laughs> and then we were kind of stuck in town. And they cleaned out the Ralphs, and um, there was no food. So, so you kind of went through what we're talking about. Well, yeah, we had yeah. one day. It was one me day. and my, my roommate Stacy and, um, and her brother and our other roommates. Um, and we had like seven boxes that had a little bit of pasta in them. <laughs> so we kind of put them all in a pot. And cooked up this thing of, like, the Rainbow Coalition pasta, we called it. <laughs> and we had, like, a nice dinner on the last night. It was like we had a bunch of pasta and bread, and we kind of had a nice dinner. And then we're all sitting there going, well, let's hope they cork this thing tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> someone's going to have to go to the store. And oh. the stores are empty. So you were kind of on the verge of some kind of weird. Yeah, one more day we would have started missing meals, or we would have had to leave town. We like we have to go yeah. to Santa Barbara or someplace and get some or thousand out Agora. We had to go to Agora. The Crips and the Bloods were the two gangs in L.A. Mm -hmm. that were constantly killing each other. You Whatever know, happened was, to them? Just... <laughs> I had a whole blue and red ensemble when I moved here because of them, and I never hear from them. They've moved into finance. <laughs> they probably yeah. have. They've moved into competing luxury boat dealerships. <laughs> but they famously called a truce. That was the crazy rumor during the riots was the Crips and the Bloods have called a truce. The rumors are but, fun, But then boring. it was, and they're coming after us. <laughs> the white people. Oh, shit. Yeah, that was the whole oh, thing. Shit. It was the, the Crips and the Bloods are going to call a truce. They met and they tied their bandanas together. Which, <laughs> But that really did happen. No, it was crazy. They tied their Is handkerchiefs together. Yes. And, and everybody was like, oh, shit. And then there was the guy. I have to think of his name. He was the guy in the L.A. riots. They pulled him out of his truck. Reginald, Reginald Denny. Denny. Reginald Denny. No, that wasn't it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Reggie. Reggie. That's the old kid. That's the old kid. Re the Re yeah, Reggie. And he, in the midst of all of that, then went to the trial and sat with the mother of the guy that did he hit him? Did yes. He? See, that's he, amazing and, stuff to me because I carry grudges just if a Ralph's guy looks at me. Oh, wrong. I know. I, yeah. yeah, I'm angry at moths still. <laughs> and do you know what he was carrying in his truck? What? Building materials for low cost housing. That's right. Is that right? So he was a good He was a guy. true Christian for what that Jeez. means. And this is a conversation that I just had with Scott Ian of Anthrax because <laughs> we were on The Talking Dead, which is the show on After the Walking Dead. And it was sort of like that you got to kill or be killed, you know, and if it's a zombie or somebody that you think is going to threaten your group, you got to kill them. And I was always like, humanity will spring forth yeah. like a tree through the concrete. Yeah. Humanity will. And, it's, yeah. and, and you never really know. Um, we were spooked because – the riots were getting closer to our house, and we thought, ooh, this might get interesting in a bad way. Kind of, <laughs> yeah. I would have kept riding my pilot, though, or whatever I Oh, was. it didn't stop me. I was in Vegas at the time, and were boy, you? those people were broken up. They were really... <laughs> didn't God. affect those degenerate oh, fucks at no. all. Huh? What are the Browns? What, did the Browns win? <laughs> <laughs> I could just imagine, like, you hear the news over the din of the casino. Los Angeles burning to the ground. <laughs> Cracks have appeared in the earth's surface, and mysterious creatures are crawling forth in the corners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody get me another tube of oxygen. <laughs> God, I hate Vegas. Yeah. I don't like to work in Vegas, and I avoid it at all costs. In my mind, I usually work when I've had enough time to forget what it's like really and i think oh, i'll be like i'll be like one of those comics in the 60s audience. i'll find my audience i'll be like in a rat pack <laughs> right. you know going down working the casino my audience there i'm like yeah, hey, bruce yeah. i'll be chatting with the jazz bows yeah, and uh, and then we'll go out later and then you just get just a bunch of fat old people and scamps yeah you know 
<laughs> can't move, can't breathe. Scamps and oxygen tanks. It's like you see these guys like in wheelchairs and oxygen tanks, and it's like you're gambling enough by being outside. <laughs> yeah. You came to the city of sin to ride roller coasters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Star Trek experience. Yeah. <laughs> Which diversion, is, diversion, divert me, distract me, distract, that's Vegas, distract me, distract me from a thought, please distract me from anything I'm thinking, like, that's the whole yeah. fuck, did the Browns win, did the Eagles win, like, don't wonder, look at the carpet, don't look at the carpet, look up, look up, look at the machines, the shiny machines, I the wonder, lights. Uh, on 9-11, the first thing that happened on 9-11 in Vegas was they started laying odds on the other building staying still, oh my god, that's funny. What did happen in Vegas on 9-11? I would love to know what happened. Nobody talks about that. There was a terrorist plan to crash a plane onto the Strip. Is that right? Yeah. That was a real plan? Oh, yeah. That was a real plan. Like, just destroy as much commerce as possible. Right. Yeah. Right. That is kind of an apocalyptical wasteland already. They would just turn that plane into a casino. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And just put a parking lot around it. Yeah. (laughs) You come into the plane. What are you talking? It's still on fire. They have machines in there. There's no limit slots at (laughs) (laughs) 9-11. The 9-11 casino. Yeah. The 9-11 is now 24-7. Come on down to the 9-11. The, the, the maitre d' is dressed like Bin Laden, like they do a whole theme thing. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Death to America, death to America. And, like, people are coming in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. And who are those comedians? They're all Middle Eastern. That They would be their resident. Axis of, the Axis, Axis of Evil uh, tour. Yeah, they would be in there. <laughs> Maz Gibrani, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Exactly, yeah. And now, filthy Americans, please welcome Bobby Kelton. Please try our take the cockpit slots. <laughs> Let's roll the dice at 9 <laughs> 11. <laughs> Oddly enough, one of the last times I shot a gun was in Vegas. Oh, uh, that it, odd? Was, it was just like, let's go out, let's do something. As you know, stuck in one of those games. Was there a rifle range or something? Went to a range. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to shoot a uh, a Walther PPK, which is James Bond's pistol. Boy, you know your guns. Yeah. Well, no, I don't really. I shot a rifle for like a half an hour and I it had hurts. a bruise oh, on no, my it, fucking it hurts. shoulder slash arm for about three days that looked like it was a tough guy. Those things where they're casually holding a machine gun and yeah. shooting from the way. What would happen really is you would fire it once and the machine gun would fly about 35 feet behind you <laughs> after dislocating your shoulder. You have to learn how to do that crap. Yet another yeah. reason why I would not be good in an apocalypse. Yeah. The first yeah. time I shoot a gun, it just flies out of my and hand. And forget a bow. I couldn't do that apocalyptical thing either. You ever try to shoot a bow? No, that's Very hard. difficult. Yeah. I you think know? I would just bow. run. I would wade into a crowd with a broken light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from my pop charts. And it would take you about 10 minutes to break the light bulb correctly. Like <laughs> I go through 40 light bulbs. Yeah. Yeah, just like a big clump of shower hair. Get away. Get away from me. <laughs> that's, that's what I... Get away from me. <laughs> or a dirty diaper. I have a diaper genie with me. Back off or I will untie this bag. I would just have a bill from a collection yeah. agency. You want to mess with me? Yeah. You see what I owe? I will read my poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll play the guitar. <laughs> Everybody's got to yeah. go with their strengths. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote my own sequel to Won't Get Fooled Again. <laughs> I will sing it now. Play your strengths. <laughs> Play your strengths. So you can't kill me. The world needs laughter. <laughs> Stand the, back. The I'm a Mike. comedian. The world needs laughter more than ever. Yes. A uh, Mr. Mike during the apocalypse. So this is nuts, huh? <laughs> if you think this is nuts, you should see my apartment right now. <laughs> Just the wasteland. Like, that would be the comics movie. Like, just walking through a wasteland with the Mr. Mike going, so what's up? (laughs) The road. (laughs) Viggo Mortensen is Bobby Slayton in The Road. The Road. I don't give a shit about the apocalypse, Slayton. I don't give a shit. How come black people are named after cars? (laughs) Viggo Mortensen. There's one guy clapping who's like just a stump. Yeah. On the it's, side yeah. of the road. Just to know, as soon as you finish the second show, we're going to eat your feet. That's great. <laughs> and now, the poem Kittens, Kittens. Author unknown, although sometimes attributed to William Wordsworth. As read as a dialogue scene between Charlton Heston and Vincent. Kittens, kittens, 
everywhere. Kittens chewing on my hair. Kittens climbing on my jeans. Kittens hanging from the screens. There's a kitten on each shoulder. Will they do this when they're older? Kittens fighting on the chairs. Kittens tumbling down the stairs. There's a kitten on my head. There's a kitten in the bread. There's a kitten in my shoe. I don't believe we have just two. But yeah, when it breaks down, all the comedians will clump together, probably. They'll all be different gangs. <laughs> There'll be a lot of weird groups. It's like the Crips and the Bloods will be together. Comedians and strippers, they'll Who's bind together. <laughs> restaurant people. Strippers and drummers, they'll go together. <laughs> It'll be just like, that'll be the one thing that stays constant. Yeah, right. It's like all the homes are gone, but strippers are still letting drummers sleep on their couch. Yes, nothing and, will change there. And when a stripper kills someone during the apocalypse, they'll have the guy behind him going, how about a hand for Amber? She just killed an intruder. <laughs> she just killed a dental technician to get a can of pineapple. Are People. you going to share your pineapple with me, you piece of shit? Guys who write fan fiction and guys who write slash fan fiction will get together. <laughs> we have just announced the Crips and the Bloods have come together, and fans of the Tim Burton and Chris Nolan Batman franchises have also called a truce. <laughs> now, guys, the way I think we should survive is just a very big forum where we interact. <laughs> Mic check. <laughs> we're screwed <laughs> or we could just go to houses late at night as if you were threatening and like knock on the door and then when you come to the door just fall down on your knees please do you have any fun size anything <laughs> it was just like every day is halloween you just have to come up with a new costume every day that's oh, true God. i'm a hobo today hobo zombie tomorrow <laughs> Hobo hate- will be the most popular costume from that day on. <laughs> <laughs> hobo zombie, hobo. That was always the shitty costume that, like, you put off your costume until too late, and then it's just, ah, fuck it, hobo, fuck it. It's the only thing that- left in the store when you're a yeah. kid. I just start ripping T-shirts when it's very <laughs> close to the hour to go to the party. Just start ripping clothes apart. <laughs> I'm the Flabby Hulk. Flabby Hulk, honey. <laughs> that was always my New Yorker cartoon that I sent in that was rejected because I got a laugh, which was, uh, <laughs> the question is, why Hulk smash? Just a psychiatrist. And then you just see big green feet on a couch in the foreground. The question is, why Hulk smash? <laughs> That's funny. Rejected for being Rejected. Funny. But all these guys that work in these gun stores, like mm-hmm. these firing ranges, like I was talking to a, one of these guys, and he's like, what I did was I saw it off the site, and I screwed in an LED light. So when I cocked the gun, I had the light right on the barrel, and that way, you know, it saves you 0.3 seconds of shooting time. And I said, well, I really don't think I, I need that. And he went, how do you know? I'm not lying. These guys are, as Ted Nugent once described himself prior to a hunt, locked, cocked, and ready to rock. You know, I've been getting into meditation and stuff lately. And, no, I'm serious. Power the meditation. Zen monks, what would they do during this whole thing? You know, the Zen monks. I just like imagine little... them suddenly like shitting giant swords <laughs> that they've had. <laughs> oh, this no. was just the greatest fake out in the history of all time. No, the Zen monks you're... have raped everybody. Well, they can control their body. <laughs> the Zen monks have been lying in wait for centuries. <laughs> Finally. No, because the one thing that disturbs me about this conversation is just – how part of humanity is just so brutal. Yes. And I want to believe that people are kind and good. You know what I mean? Because we're talking about when shit goes down, yeah. it's just going to be this horrific shit. And that I is just what... can't cope with that in my yes. little love head that I'm trying to cultivate. But that is what The Walking Dead aspires to in, in its best episodes. It really does. It's like, it does? See, yeah. Or Battlestar Galactica or any great allegory. Mm-hmm. Lord of the Flies, to actually use the best example last. <laughs> you know, two TV yeah. shows. It's like King Kong versus Godzilla, or King Lear actually tells the story better. Uh, it's like that episode of Space Academy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you've seen Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, or Stanley Kubrick's Paths of Glory. Um, no, but since I'm illiterate, tell me what you were going to say. Well, about that, that when humanity is mm-hmm. stripped down and you are basically surviving. That both of those sides coexist. There is the primitive reptilian brain that will allow me to survive if I have to kill everything around me. And then that battles with the higher self of we are civilized. 
we are not animals, that we are civilized, and we have a responsibility to civilization to, to, to maintain that. And that will happen over time. I mean, and then it decays. That's the nature of systems. The Lord of the Flies is a beautiful analogy of systems. People under duress form a collective to survive, and then the first thing that happens is that collective splits into two collectives, and mm. they battle each other. You know, it's really fascinating. And you have to, when you apply that to, say, Los Angeles, yeah. or, that's what happens under duress. Here, people will fuck you over for <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, That is very true. So imagine to... when the shit really goes down. Yeah. If you've ever tried to park at Trader Joe's at exactly. 5 o'clock on oh, Wednesday. Dude. Right. Dude. That's like Road Warrior. That is Road Warrior. <laughs> people who think that liberals are all pussies have never tried to park at a Trader Joe's at 5 on a Wednesday. <laughs> That's so true. You know, it's all these bearded guys in Priuses and Birkenstocks going, get the fuck out of I my know. fucking space. There's nothing worse than an angry, hippie-ish person yeah. to yeah. like defeat your, your love of life. Yeah, <laughs> your, your, your nascent your love belief. of humanity. Now, would you have a gun? Me? Yeah. Um, you know, I probably would be driven to that. But I am such a non-gun person. Like, you were raised with them. Yeah. We were not at all. I never touched a gun until about a month ago. During um, an argument. I went to a... What? <laughs> <laughs> now, I've had this fucking thing here for a while. But, uh, you know, someone took me to a rifle range. I was like, all right, I'll go. They had a coupon. Yeah. I was like, I'll go. <laughs> you know, and it was kind of fun. We was it in Southern California? Shooting. Yeah, it was in uh, Van Nuys. Chino. Oh, it was, it was a nice one in Van Nuys. <laughs> They're all out in the warehouse districts. It's like, you can just tell there's like, this is the gun range. That is probably a <laughs> snuff Van... film studio. Oh, shit. In Van <laughs> Nuys. Yeah, Van Nuys is a little weird. Yeah, a lot of mysterious buildings in Van Nuys. But we were shooting skeet. And it was kind of boring to me. But when you do hit it, I was like, oh, oh, I can hit things. And I don't know. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I had a huge bruise. I was like, eh. And when I was so glad to just get the hell out of there, you know? Yeah. It's, they're loud. Yeah. They smell. Yeah. Like cordite. Yeah. yeah. And so you're always like, don't watch where you're pointed. Like if someone could get hurt constantly. I just know yeah. I hurt myself in my home on anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It, there, there's not a day that goes by where I don't, like, cut That's myself so open with porcelain or something like that. <laughs> Give me a gun and Matt, everyone dies. Yes. <laughs> Matt cut his hand open on an apple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's round and smooth. Bullshit. I call bullshit. No, the stem. Okay. <laughs> That's one of the worst stem gashes I've ever seen. <laughs> I got a cotton cut. Is it I a don't... jazz apple? <laughs> that we need you in an emergency right now, doctor. Jazz apple cut. Stanch the blood on this jazz apple wound. <laughs> She's going into labor, doctor. I'm stanching the blood of a jazz apple stem wound. She's going to have to do it on her own. That's obviously a temper wound. <laughs> Give what her a shoe to bite on. Now, you have kids, so you kind of have to go to, yes. to this prep yeah. place. But I don't know about you, Matt, but I don't even go to this yeah. mental... So My idea is, like, I will, I will deal with that when it happens, and then I'm just going to be on instinct. What you <laughs> know? Yes, the instinctual <laughs> yeah. comedian. Yeah. What you do when you find yourself responsible for other people is you begin to remove from your life situations that require the phrase, then... If you're lucky, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Have big earthquake, yeah, big earthquake, but if you're lucky, everything will be fine. That's why I never went bungee jumping. How do you bungee yeah. jump? You tie yourself to a bridge with a rubber band. <laughs> then you jump off the bridge. If you're lucky. <laughs> Who's in charge of this? Some college kids. <laughs> Ooh, nothing to go wrong there. College kids, porn stars. <laughs> yeah. We went uh, zip lining. In, what uh, the hell is that? In Costa Rica, which is they tie these ropes mm -hmm. to trees 30, 40, 50 feet above the jungle floor. And you're on a harness and you slide from tree to tree on this rope. You did that? Yes. But Terrifying or? Fantastic. Exhilarating. Oh, you've done it? Yeah. But you do realize, so we're doing this in Costa Rica and I'm like, well, there's clearly safety standards. There'll be no problem. So we zip line through and it's really fascinating. The next day, we take this boat out to this little island to look at howler monkeys, or as they say, the howler monkey. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to see howler monkey. I love monkeys. We're in this little boat, me, my wife, our children. Name dropper. <laughs> we go out in the thing. Boat's heavy. Nobody's in a life jacket. And we're in the water. And I go, should we have life jackets on? And the guy goes, 
Yeah. You put him in there. And he's like, <laughs> you like, had to bring it up. And we're in the water. And he like points to a hutch. And there's life jackets. So we start putting life jackets on everybody. And then, you know, the water is like, it's a little motorboat. It's not right. a big boat. Right, right. And then, um, well, da, 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 be careful. There's crocodiles over here. Like, there's crocodiles in this water? Yeah. So we went out into the water in a boat <laughs> full of crocodiles without life jackets. And then I start to think back to the day before, to the zip lining. They're not big on safety standards here. <laughs> I have a feeling that zip line was not as secure as it would have been in, say, Six Flags. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's no board of zip lining in Costa Rica. I'm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. I'm the president of the board of zip lining, <laughs> and you will address me as such. I had a similar thing in the Bahamas. Uh, we went out to do some snorkeling, and I'm swimming around, and there's a bunch of mm-hmm. these what look like jellyfish. Ooh. And so I get back in the Ooh. boat, and I go to the captain, oh. and I go, hey, there's a bunch of jellyfish. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and I go, uh, you know, I'm swimming around them, and I always heard that they're poisonous. Is there any danger? And he goes, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they're so sick of the paradise they're yeah. in. Like, yeah. Look, it's beautiful here, and I can't take yeah. it because yeah. inside, I don't feel what the outside reflects. Board of Paradise. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, to just walk around a mall would be so nice. <laughs> you know what I'm waiting for? The apocalypse. <laughs> so. I'm saving for a cubicle. You know what they dream about? Fluorescent lights. <laughs> <laughs> Fluorescent lights. To maybe, you know, to maybe work uh, in a parking garage. To be the guy on the stool in front of that uh, cabinet full of keys. Oh, oh I just want God. to be able to get five minutes out by the dumpster breaking boxes <laughs> to keep from killing myself in a retail hell. We all have dreams, my friend. There is nothing but physical and natural beauty here, and it's killing me. <laughs> oh, look, the howler monkey <laughs> mocking me <laughs> for my... My life sentence here in paradise. My brother drives bull semen samples between two competing labs in Arizona. His wife lost her eye in an accident and refuses to wear a patch. I dream I am him. No matter where we live, in the city or the country, we must be ready all the time for the atomic bomb. Duck and cover! That's the first thing to do. The next important thing to do after that is to stay covered until the danger is over. Yes, we must all get ready now so we know how to save ourselves if the atomic bomb ever explodes near us. But there might not be any grown-ups around when the bomb explodes. Then you're on your own. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Engineering by Brent Butler. Internet junk by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing, effects, and everything else by Jolinda Palmer. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. Want to get fried chicken? Yeah, Mongo, let's get fried chicken. Another couple saved. <laughs> All